So I'm gonna kind of chop this topic up into three segments. First, some of the settings of the R10, why they're important and what they do. Second, the different shooting modes. And third, some of the fundamental creative guidelines of photography that are gonna make it much easier for you to get stunning images, whether you're a beginner or an advanced photographer. And if you watch to the end of the video, then I'm confident that not only are you gonna walk away as a better photographer, but you're gonna be much more familiar with your Canon R10 and its capabilities. So let's start with the settings. There's three main things that you're gonna have to become familiar with and eventually master. The first one is called ISO. And all that does is determine how sensitive your camera is to the light that's available. It's one of the three settings that affects your exposure. And if you set your exposure too high, your image is gonna be overexposed. That means your highlights are gonna be blown out. And if you set your exposure too low, that means your image is gonna be too dark. So moving along, the next thing that we're gonna focus on is our aperture. Did you get it? Focus, aperture, forget it. And our aperture is the little hole in the front of the lens that allows light to pass through and hit your sensor. And how wide your aperture can open is represented by a number that's usually written on the front of the lens called your f-stop. It'll say like f2.8, f4, f5.6, etc. Now, the closer that number is to zero, then the wider your lens can open up. And the wider that it can open up, the more light it's gonna allow to pass through to hit your sensor. And lenses that have an aperture that can open up very wide are referred to as fast lenses, which are generally lenses with an aperture of f2.8 or better. And fast lenses are gonna be more expensive than normal lenses because they're gonna do better in low light and they're gonna allow you to get that blurry background, also known as bokeh. And I'm gonna detail for you exactly how the aperture affects the blurry background in the next section where we discuss our shooting modes. And I'll also let you know my favorite fast lens for the R10 that's gonna help you get that sought after blurry background. But for now, let's move on to the next setting that we need to discuss, which is shutter speed. And to understand how shutter speed works, we have to visualize the sensor inside of the camera. So let's say you have your camera sensor right here, right? Well, in front of the camera sensor, there's a mechanism called the shutter. Now, when you hit the button to take a video or to take a snapshot on your camera, that shutter opens up and then closes. Now, the longer that the shutter stays open, the more light it's gonna allow to hit your sensor. So let's say you set the shutter speed to 1 100th of a second. It's gonna let in a certain amount of light, right? But now let's say you set it to 1 1,000th of a second. Now it's gonna let in a lot less light. So those are the three settings that are gonna affect your exposure. And together, they're referred to as your exposure triangle. ISO, aperture, shutter speed. Illuminati confirmed. Nah, I'm just playing. But let's get back on track though. So if what we covered so far still hasn't sunken in and it still seems a little confusing, then don't even sweat it. Because for one thing, you can always watch the video again, go back, take some notes, etc. And two, the Canon R10 already comes with some automatic shooting modes, which we're gonna discuss next. And those automatic shooting modes are gonna pretty much handle everything for you. But it's extremely important that you understand what's going on under the hood of your camera and that you're eventually able to use manual mode where you can set the ISO, the aperture and the shutter speed yourself because those automatic shooting modes are stupid. Now I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean that in a literal way. What I mean is the camera doesn't understand what type of scene you're looking at. So it's gonna make its best guess as to what each of those settings should be. But oftentimes the various automatic modes do a decent job. So let's go ahead and get into those so you can see what each mode does and how to use them properly. But before we do, I need you to hit that like button if you've enjoyed the video so far. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. I I appreciate that. So let's go ahead and get into the options on this mode dial. The first one that we're gonna discuss is called creative filters mode. And it's this symbol with these two circles that are overlapping each other. And all you really need to know about this mode is that you should never use it. And why, you may be asking? Well, it's because all it's gonna do is gonna add some filters to your photos that you can't remove after the fact. So let's say you find yourself in a once in a lifetime situation where an opportunity comes up to take an amazing photo and you got one of them crazy looking filters on there. Once you snap the photo, you're never gonna be able to go back and remove that filter from the image. Whereas if you were to just take a normal photo, you can always take that photo into Lightroom or whichever editing software you prefer and add any filter that you like on it without ruining the image. So what I would recommend instead is that you go to my website, 
FulanCreative.com and you purchase my Lightroom Profile Pack, which is gonna give you 11 creative filters that are gonna make your photos look amazing. And it's only 15 bucks. And no doubt, that was a shameless plug. But seriously, don't ruin your photos by using this creative filters mode. So if we move to the next setting on the dial, it's the one that says, SCN, which is your special scene mode. And this is an automatic shooting mode that has preset options for different types of scenes. Now I can see the sports mode potentially coming in handy if you're shooting a fast moving subject and you're not familiar with how to use manual mode. But other than that, it's mostly all gimmicks. So I would stay away from the special scenes mode and instead I would encourage you to focus on the modes that we're about to discuss so that you know what settings to use for all these various type of scenes you may find yourself in. Now if we move that dial one more notch, we have an A with a plus next to it. And this is your fully automatic mode. When you put your camera in this mode, it pretty much operates like a point and shoot, where you have no control over anything at all and you're letting the camera do everything for you. Sometimes you may get some decent results, but again, this is one of those things where you want to use in the beginning, but you want to kind of slowly wean yourself off of. And if we move the notch, the next setting we have is the one that says FV, which means flexible priority. Now to be able to understand what this mode is for, first you have to properly understand two other modes, shutter priority and aperture priority. And this is where it starts to get juicy because once you're comfortable with aperture priority and shutter priority, then you're just a step away from using the complete manual mode, which is gonna give you full control over your camera. So let's first move the notch to shutter priority, which is the one that says TV. What this mode does is that it allows you to set the shutter speed and then the camera is going to try to maintain the correct exposure by automatically adjusting your ISO and your aperture. Now the ISO, the only function that it has is for your exposure. In the case of shutter speed, not only is it going to affect your exposure, but it's going to affect the amount of motion blur that you have in your photo. And why in the world would you want motion blur in your photo? Well, have you ever seen those beautiful photos of waterfalls where everything looks nice and sharp, but when you look at the water, it has this soft misty look to it. The way they achieve that look is by using a slow shutter speed. So a good shutter speed to start with for normal handheld footage is one one hundredth of a second. But in the case of those waterfall photographs, what they've done is that they've lowered the shutter speed to like one tenth of a second or something slow like that. So what's happening is that everything that's still in the photo looks sharp but anything that's moving is leaving behind a motion trail. That's what gives it that soft look. You've probably seen a similar effect in those photos where you see a skyline or highways where all the cars and everything are leaving a beautiful light trail behind them. That's also done with slow shutter photography. Now those are just two examples of situations where you would want to introduce motion blur into your photo, but the creative possibilities are endless. And if you want to attempt slow shutter photography, then I strongly advise you to pick up a nice tripod and a fluid head because if there's any movement in the camera at all when you're taking your photo it's not gonna work the camera has to stay perfectly still and if you don't already have a good tripod then it's one of the first things that I would invest in and I'll leave a link below to a good tripod and fluid head that I recommend so now that you're familiar as to when you would use a slow shutter speed to introduce motion trail and blur into your image let's discuss the opposite when you would use an extremely fast shutter speed that's gonna eliminate all motion blur. Let's say one five hundredth of a second or one one thousandth of a second. Have you ever seen those photos of an athlete, let's say a basketball player who's in the middle of a dunk? The photo looks so nice and sharp and beautiful that it almost looks like he was posing mid-air for the photo. Well, he most definitely wasn't. What happened was that a skilled photographer was able to take a photo of him exactly at the right moment and had the shutter speed set so high that there's no motion trail and it basically froze the action as it was happening. Now here's a tip. If you attempt this type of photography, then you need to put your camera in what's called burst mode, which is when you can hit the button and it's going to fire off a whole bunch of shots consecutively. Executively. That way you don't have to catch the athlete exactly at the right time because if you were to try to do that and just take one shot at a time trying to 
click it exactly when he's in the right position, you're always going to be too late. So what you would do instead is use burst mode with a high shutter speed and then you would go back and look through those 100 or 200 or even 500 images and eliminate all the ones that are out of focus or all the ones that you don't want and keep that one or two photos where you were able to freeze the action exactly at the right time. So I hope that illustrates to you as to why you would want to lock in your shutter speed at a particular setting and how shutter priority mode is going to help you to do that. So let's move on to aperture priority, which is the symbol on the dial that says AV. So in aperture priority mode, you get to set the aperture and the camera is going to handle the ISO and the shutter speed. And just like your shutter speed affects the exposure, but also has an additional function, the aperture affects the exposure, but it also has an additional function. And what that is, is that your aperture controls was called your depth of field. And the depth of field simply refers to how much of your image is in focus. So if you look at me right now, you'll notice that my face is in focus. But if you look at those lights in the background, they're nice and blurry. That's because I have my aperture open wide, so it's giving me a shallow depth of field. Right now it's set at f1.8. That means that it's wide open. Now speaking of fast lenses, I find that the Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8 is the perfect lens for the Canon R10. It's my favorite APS-C lens ever made and the bokeh that it produces is stunning. It's an EF mount lens, so you need an adapter to use it with the R10. But I wouldn't buy the little $60 normal adapter. Instead, what I would recommend is that you spend $160 and you get the drop-in ND filter adapter from Mica because not only is it going to allow you to use EF and EFS lenses on your RF mount camera, but it also functions as a variable ND filter and also has the option for a CPL filter, a clear filter, and a black mist filter. So it's an all-in-one solution. And in my opinion, it's the single best accessory available for RF mount cameras. And I'll leave a link below to the Mica drop-in ND adapter as well as the Sigma 18 to 35. So now that we've understood our aperture priority and our shutter priority, we can go back to that mode that we talked about earlier, which had the FV, which stands for flexible priority. And what that does is it just basically allows you to switch between shutter priority, aperture priority, auto ISO, and full on manual mode without having to switch anything on the dial. So it's just another way to use the various modes using the LCD screen instead of having to flip that dial. Now if we move the dial one more notch, we have a P, which means program mode. And you could think of this as ISO priority because what you're going to be able to do is you set the ISO while the camera is going to handle the shutter speed and the aperture for you. Now in my opinion, the only modes that really offer any value other than the manual mode are the shutter priority and the aperture priority and also the flexible priority as all it does is let you access those other modes. But if you really want to become a better photographer and have control over every aspect of your camera, then you should really start experimenting with full-on manual mode as soon as possible. And that's the mode that you see on the dial where it says M because this is the mode that's going to ultimately allow you to have full creative control over your camera and its settings. And really, it's not that difficult. As long as you know how to set your exposure, utilizing your exposure triangle, you understand depth of field and motion blur, then you're pretty much good to go. And that brings us to our final segment, which is composition. And in my experience, the most useful creative guideline for composition is called the rule of thirds. And all you have to do is to take the most important elements in your photo and correspond them to those lines and especially where those lines intersect. And remember, this is meant to be a creative guideline that's gonna help you get good composition. It's not written in stone. Sometimes you may prefer to fudge the rules a little bit. Now this was a super simplified explanation of the rule of thirds, but it's enough to get you out there so you can start experimenting for yourself. And in the future, I may do a detailed video about the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, and other important aspects of composition. So make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell icon so that you're notified when I release new videos. And now that you know the basics of your camera, I hope you go out there and capture some amazing images. And you should know that your skills and creativity are the most important elements in your photography. But there's also some accessories out there that you can purchase that are going to help take your photography to the next level. And that's why I highly suggest that you watch this video right here where I share seven pieces of must-have gear for your Canon R10. And I also left links below to all the gear that I discussed in this video. I hope you found this video valuable and I'll see you in the next one. It's Fulan Creative and I'm out. Peace.